he's like, mom, it's not time, right? With the water to wine and all that, you know, but, it, you know, and you kind of saw that moment of Jesus kind of going, am I going to listen to mom here? Or am I going to listen to dad? It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marked by dust and sweat and blood. Welcome to the Men in the Arena podcast, where we interview specialists in the realm of manhood. Each of our guests is an expert in their chosen field or cause as it relates to men. Our conviction is to call you into the arena of manhood, call you out of the faceless, nameless bleachers, and call you up to be the best version of you. Because when a man gets it, everyone wins. Enjoy today's episode. Men in the Arena Army, we salute you. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. I'm Jim Ramos, and I'm your host of your show today, guys. I'm really excited about today's guest. This guy produces a TV series that has two seasons, and I've actually watched both seasons three times. Three times. Are you curious? No, it's not SpongeBob. Anyway, hey guys, before we get into our guest and, and our interview with him, I want to go through our one of our man laws with you today. Remember, guys, our man laws are supplied by you, our heroes. And when we use yours, we will send you some swag. So you just hit us up at info at men in the arena.org. Uh, give us your mailing address. We'll mail that stuff out to you. And if you want, listen, guys, this is something that we're learning. If you want to send us uh, a man law, please. Either message us through Instagram or send us an email at info at meninarena.org. Uh, I've had a couple man laws get lost in the shuffle. We try to answer all of your responses on social media, but when you send us a man law, you really need to send it through a message. So, guys, thanks for that. Hey, today's man law comes from my friend Fred uh, W. out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. And Fred, if you know Fred, I know Fred. He's a he's a, one of our arena coaches. He's a big uh, muscular doctor, and uh, his man law is this. When you're lifting weights at the gym, you never walk in front of a guy in the middle of his set. And I would add this, especially if that dude is bigger than you. So, Fred, thank you, man. You finally got one. So uh, hit us up at info at with your address. We will send you some swag. So, guys, that's great. I also want to talk to you about our hero story again. Guys, you are the hero in the story that God has placed you in. When a man gets it, everyone wins. And here's a hero story from James on Instagram. And James said, this is a powerful story, guys. He said, hey, brother, let me tell you how I was inspired the other day. I was involved in an accident that broke my back in three places, left me with incomplete paralysis below the waist. I've been very interactive since then and, quote, on the poor me potty for too long. Dang it. Get off your butt and do some push-ups. I'm the victor, not the victim. Stories of miracles in my life need to be shared. It's high time to let others know that God is still a God of miracles today. Everyone has a story. Just get up and be the warrior and victor that God has called you to be. I don't know about you guys. But I'm getting pumped. He continues, I'll be the slow process getting about 10 to 20 modified push-ups per day. So this guy's paralyzed doing our 65,000 push-up challenge. He says, it's progress. The physical challenge is helping in other areas of my emotional and spiritual life as well. To God be the glory for his victories yet to come. James, thank you so much. Man, I'd love to hit you up and talk to you about maybe coming on our show. I'm interested in your story. So, man, that's really, really powerful. Guys, make sure you hit us up with your hero stories. And we really don't care about you telling us how awesome we are. We already know that. We want you to tell us about how awesome God is and what he's doing in your life through the ministries of men in the arena. So guys, uh, thank you so much for con your continual uh, responses of your hero story. Hey guys, I'm super excited to bring on our new friend, Chad Gunderson today. He's 44 years old, lives in small town near Fort Worth, Texas. He's married to his beautiful wife, Amanda, for 17 years. Chad's producing career began over 25 years ago while in college at the University of North Texas. While there, he founded Night and Day Films in 2000 and made numerous award-winning commercials, music videos, and short films. Going out on his own in 2006, he started Gunderson Entertainment, where he worked alongside studios like 20th Century Fox, Lionsgate, and Sony to produce multiple life-changing films. And then in 2015, 
Chad started Out of Order Studios. He and his partner have produced numerous TV shows, animated projects, and feature films, including the groundbreaking TV series. Are you guys ready? I've been telling you about this. The Chosen, which is our topic for today. And guys, as you know, I'm a massive fan of this show uh, and many of you know why but we're going to get into that today today chad it's great to have you on the show man welcome brother uh man really really appreciate it thanks for having me on man we're, we're so excited to have you on hey before we jump in here uh let, why don't you take some time to just tell us a little bit about your personal life the things you enjoy just a little bit more about yourself sure um so yeah live in in small town texas um you know grew up here um i was actually born in nebraska um, but I have that bumper sticker that says I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as quick as I could. Um, and uh, we, we've, uh, I, I'm still in the same small town um, that I grew up in. My entire family and my wife's entire family, we all live in about a 10 mile radius. Um, and that includes brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews and, and all of those things. Uh, parents still live uh, in the area. Um, and uh, like I said, it's, I, I, I like to say that I'm not country, I'm small town. Um, even yeah. though we did a lot, a lot of country things and, you know, we do all the things we hunt and we fish and we we're, we're out as side as much as we can, but at the same time, I do make movies for a living. And so that does make it fairly unique. And yeah, there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of movie producers in uh, small town, Texas, uh, even though Texas is growing uh, within that industry quite a bit. Um, so, uh, again, uh, grew up in Texas, kind of had the fairly normal Texas upbringing, played football, obviously, like everybody does in Texas. Um, I actually went on and played uh, played sports in college. Uh, I went on a football scholarship actually out to California, played at Pomona College, um, small D3 school um, out there in L.A., uh, near L.A. Um, ended up making their volleyball team as well. Um, I played volleyball all growing up, so played football and volleyball there. Um, but after my uh, freshman year of college, let's just say God started doing some moving in my life. And, uh, you know, when you uh, w when you quit sports, the, the money uh, just magically disappears. I don't know how that happens. Right. So uh, but I, I actually was going to stick around and play volleyball. But obviously the football money was more than the volleyball money. So ended up back in Texas um, was going to be um, was actually going to go down to Texas A&M. That's where my brother went to school, spent a lot of time down there with the Aggies. Um, and was going to go there and transfer, but I literally was one credit short of being a transfer student to oh, go to a and wow. I wasn't, I wasn't a new student anymore. I was a transfer student because obviously I just done a year of college. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, I'll just go somewhere local, you know, for a semester or two. And then I'll, I'll jump down there and ended up at the University of North Texas, which is, uh, you know, a great school uh, in the DFW area. Um, and it does have a large uh, liberal arts uh, school. Uh, their jazz department is like number one in the world. Like there are people that go, well, I couldn't decide between UNT and, and Juilliard, but I chose Juilliard or sorry, I chose wow. UNT for jazz specifically. So, but that it's across the board, their film, their arts, all those things. Um, and so I was a biology major in college. Sports medicine was where I was going. It's what I always wanted to do was to work in sports. Um, and continued to do that while at North Texas. But on the side, I was taking theater classes. I was taking film classes. I was kind of doing these things. And to be honest with you, it's just funny looking back to see kind of how God kind of orchestrates those kinds of things. Um, and then literally my senior year at UNT, I ended up staying there. Uh, my first semester there, when I was there, I got cast in like five of the student films as, a, as an actor because I had done theater growing up. But again, just hobby stuff, had fun with it, never really thought about it as a career. Uh, but then kind of getting immersed in that um, that culture, that that sort of thing, it just God kind of just started changing my heart. And um, and so my senior year, I ended up switching to film. I stayed there um, and then wow. uh, switched to film. Uh, the, the weird thing is, is at that point, um, all of my uh, film credits, it, it became my major and all my you know, I had all these electives, you know, my electives became organic chemistry and cell biology and all those kinds of things. Switched to film um, and uh, finished up with a film degree. And then, as you mentioned uh, in the in my little bio there, my senior year of college, I had started gun, um, uh, night and day films is what I had started originally. And like I said, just started doing commercials and music videos and anything we could point a camera at. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, by default, I became a producer. Again, not, my intention was not to be a producer. But within this company, my business partner in that company, he was a creative, right? He was a writer and a director, and I was an actor. So like when we did the burrito commercial, I was the hand holding the burrito, and I was the voiceover, and I was this. And by default, our company just didn't have a true producer. 
And I just had a knack for that. I had a, an ability to lead people. People would follow me for whatever re crazy reason. And God just kind of started shifting those things. And the next thing I know, I kind of just became a producer. Um, and then obviously, you know, after graduation, things kind of started taking off and, and uh, you know, and here we are today. But, uh, you know, even meeting Dallas Jenkins goes way back. Dallas and I have known each other about 20 years now. Um, I literally wrote his dad a fan letter. So his dad is Jerry Jenkins, right? Wrote all oh, the yeah. left behind uh -huh. books. Uh -huh. yep. Huge uh -huh. author, you know, was, a, was yep. a fan of his. And I literally wrote a fan letter to Jerry. And this was just probably, I don't know, a year or two out of college. And just said, hey, I'm a film student. You know, I have a small company. I'm a quote unquote producer. Definitely wasn't at that point. Um, and if these books ever get made into a film, I'd love to, to be a part of them. And he wrote me back and he said, well, funny, you should wow. say this. My, my son, Dallas, and Dallas is, I think, a year or two older than me. Um, he's working with the company to make these left behind books into a film. You know, long story short there, those kind of became what they became. And, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever. Yeah, say no uh, more. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, they, they did. And, and so Dallas and Jerry, they decided to go off on their own and uh, start their own thing. Um, and so Dallas, as we stayed in touch, you know, over the, probably the following year or so, Dallas says, Hey, I'm directing my first short film. He and his dad had produced some stuff that were based on his work and stuff, but uh -huh. Dallas had never, never directed. And he said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be out in LA doing my first short film. There's already a producer attached, but Hey man, we've just kind of gotten to know each other if you want to come out and help out. So kind of did the whole, you know, I'm going to fly myself out. I'm going to sleep on his hotel room floor. I'm going to work for free as an unpaid PA, right? And a PA in the industry is production assistant. It's the lowest of the low, like you're barely above yeah. an intern, right? Um, but by the end of that short film, I was a co-producer on the project. Um, and then based off of that, we, Dallas and I did another short film together. Um, and that short film called Midnight Clear became he and I's uh, first feature film together. And our first feature, wow. his first feature as a director, my first feature as a producer, um, and then things just kind of take, took off from there. That would have been 2005 ish. Um, and Dallas and I haven't worked together since then until the chosen, uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, but just stayed in touch, you know, kind of, Hey, what are you working on? What are you doing? Hey, we got to find something to do together. And it just never worked out. And then, uh, you know, three or four years ago now, uh, Dallas calls me up and said, Hey, I did this short film. It's getting some recognition and he made it for his church. Right. And the story behind that is amazing. And he goes, and it's kind of getting, yeah, the shepherd, right? Yep. And he uh -huh. says, "Hey, it's getting some, getting some traction, and we've got these other guys that believe in it, want to help us." That was uh, Angel Studios, and then the executive mm -hmm. producer Daryl Eves, who's a, a big YouTube guy that uh, he's just a guru. Um, and he goes, "You know what? We're we're going to try this crowdfunding thing. It probably won't work." Um, and me and my business partner Chris June, uh, we both kind of go, "Man, crowdfunding? That, that's not no." And then, and to be honest with you, <laughs> and. And to be honest with you, a Jesus project wasn't really on our list, right? Because if you think about your typical Jesus yeah. project, it's, you know, the blonde hair, blue eyed, pious. Wimp. He's, he's yeah, a pansy yeah, he's, who's our savior. Uh, yeah. It's yeah, like, it's, it's, I want to ask you about that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Completely that, unemotional. That's, that's, yeah. Yes. And, and like, <laughs> I'm like, really, this guy attracted guys to follow him. Exactly. You know, no exactly. wonder our pastors and a lot of our churches are so wimpy. They're following Jesus in the media. That's right. That's right. So after <laughs> reading the script, obviously, we're like, oh, my gosh, wait a minute. You guys are doing something different here. So we were honored yep. to come on and produce the show. And, um, you know, and then obviously now it's just continued to get crazier and crazier. So. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of that story. And there's some other ones we definitely can get into um, that just to watch God work and to watch him just kind of do the things that he does. Uh, it's been, it's been quite a journey for sure. Man, that is so cool. I, you know, I kind of got locked in a little bit on your uh, Pomona deal. Cause my son just finished his college career at D three. They got beat in the playoffs by uh, Mary Harden Baylor who went oh, on yeah. to win the national championship. So we were just in Belton, Texas yeah, a little yeah. while ago. So what position yeah. did you play? Uh, I was a fullback. So, um, back, oh, that's back what I the... played in college. Come on, brother. Lead. Come oh, on. yeah. What, what's give me, give me your college height and weight. Uh, in college, I was probably 220, um, you know, and, uh, and, uh, probably pushed 230 by the time, you know, kind of really maxed out there. And I'm a little heavier than that now, obviously, but I'm actually pretty short. I'm only 5'11. Um, um, had offers to play linebacker as well. I played both ways, you know, which obviously doesn't happen yeah. a lot anymore. And, you know, obviously, you know, I'd rather carry the ball. And I was a running fullback. You know, I ran the trap like nobody, man. I could freaking – and, uh, you know, uh, I was uh, – so it was just different getting into college, which as I'm sure you know, right? It's oh, just that's the mentality awesome. yeah, shift, I was a six, all that. 
that's yeah. uh, I was a six foot two twenty, and uh, and actually was a we called ourselves full blocks because in a four year uh, four years of starting I carried the ball eighteen times. We oh, just yeah. pounded. You know, I was a blocking back. So anyway, I had to. I'm gonna go back. <laughs> I, sorry about the rabbit trail, guys. I had to do the whole big dumb jock thing so we'll, we'll guys, reminisce uh, so, all day baby come on <laughs> oh, oh you know in a tree stand hunting whitetail in in west texas come on anyway uh anyway uh, hey what so so when you look at the chosen uh, to me i when i was sent this dvd series i put the first dvd in and i was extremely skeptical right Yep. You know, and by the end of it, I'm crying. I've cried after every episode. You talked about yep. the shepherd, which is a bonus feature. Uh, showed that to my family at Christmas. We're all crying. There's just something about this series that has deeply impacted me as a man. Mm. Yep. So what factors would you say explain the global success of The Chosen? I mean, you're coming up to a billion a billion watches so aren't you over a billion yeah, yeah. or you're getting close yeah well, i think uh, at least through the app alone which is probably the main place where people see it i think we're at about 350 yeah. million um, but then you look at all the other platforms right we just launched on amazon prime so season one and season two is on amazon prime um so that's obviously oh, awesome. pre pre pretty big deal and it's very easy now too you know because some people you know the app well the app is obviously quite easy and it's not a difficult thing um, everybody always says, what's it on? Is it on Netflix or is it on Amazon or is it on Hulu or whatever? And so we are on prime now so they can watch it there. Um, but we're on multiple That's platforms. Awesome. Um, we are literally in every nation, uh, in the world. Um, I think we're in season one is, I want to say 90 languages season two. I think we're at about 60 um and that's uh, uh subtitled and obviously we are looking at dubbed as well you know where the wow. voice is and the the key there is probably the eight major languages i think there's seven or eight major languages in the world and that's kind of what we're focused on right now um but to be honest with you it, it's one of those things where we kind of say it over and over again we have no clue what has made this successful right i mean uh, other than you know, God is doing a work, you know, there's a ton of great shows out there that nobody's seen. And there's a ton of crappy shows out there that everybody's seen, right? So oh, there's kind of no, there's no rhyme or reason to how or why. And again, especially the, the global reach. Now, again, I think God has assembled a team within the show for such a time as this, right? And Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I look at myself, um, my business partner, Chris, which, uh, you know, I can tell his, his backstory. He worked in the studio system for 20 years in LA and was just like, I gotta get out of here, but he's an amazing filmmaker, smarter than anybody I know. And then you kind of look at Dallas and his creativity and the way his brain works and this, this vision that God gave him and the writers that are a part of it, Ryan and Tyler, all the way to Daryl Eves, who's our, our executive producer. And he's this YouTube guru, right? So a lot of it, I have to give credit to him because he just knows how to make things successful online, right? And some of his, mm -hmm. uh, his he doesn't even call them clients, partnerships, whatever he calls them. You know, people like Mr. Beast and some of these others that have literally billions and billions of views. He just knows how to work that sort of system. But then at the same time, it's just like, man, there, there's no way, right? Like God is just for whatever reason, you know, and, and honestly, I'd, I'd say our biggest prayer. And while I kind of say it jokingly, it couldn't be more true is we literally are just like, Lord, just don't let us screw this up. Like, man, totally. He, he he's doing something and it's always up to us, right. To just, just yep. jack this up and do something stupid or let egos or money or whatever the case may be, or the fame of it all. Um, just get in the way. And uh, we're just like, you know, we just got to put our heads down and just kind of keep going. Um, and <laughs> part of putting your head down is just sitting there and praying about it, which we do a lot. So, yeah. um, but I also think too, I think, you know, at least on a more personal, you know, micro level, you know, we were just talking about, you know, Jesus and the, our character of Jesus um, is not your typical thing, right? Again, the majority of TV shows, you know, outside of maybe Passion of the Christ, right? Like there's, the majority of uh, movies about Jesus, obviously there's never been a TV show like this about Jesus. So you can't really say that, but they always focus on the deity of Christ, right? He's very pious. Yes. He's very unemotional. He doesn't, doesn't get angry, doesn't get happy, doesn't get sad, doesn't do any of those things 
but yet our Bible is, it, it talks about all kinds of emotions that he had, right? And all of these things. And we like to kind of say that we don't focus on the deity of Christ, which obviously in the show, if you've watched it, you know, we, we, we don't ignore that either. Obviously, he is very much Lord and Savior. But what we do focus on is the humanity of Christ. God sent yes. Christ, he, he, God sent Christ here so that he, that, that he could relate to us, right? He, he didn't send, he didn't just come down and walk on the planet like a superhero, right? He came down to say, I understand and I love you and I care for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm allow my son to go through many of the things that you go through so that you know, that we know that we love you. Right. Like, and that yeah. I think has been a big part of it is just the humanity of Christ. Um, not ignoring, you know, the, uh, the deity of him as well. But uh, I think that's kind of helped relate. And then obviously, honestly, the biggest focus of the show is not necessarily Christ either. It's all these people around him, the disciples, Mary Magdalene, all of that. And everybody can go, I see myself in that. I see myself in that. I mean, for me, like I think you mentioned, right? The end of episode one is still my favorite scene. When Mary Magdalene, and he says, you know, I've called you by name. Uh, it's not, oh, uh, wrecks me. <laughs> it wrecked me, <laughs> you know? I, I was um, crying <laughs> because I, I was crying <laughs> this third time through because I've watched it three times through. I was crying because I knew what was coming. You, I, you It's just... It, I, I can't explain to men how important it is for these guys to watch this. Right, It'll right, change right. your entire perspective of Jesus. You talked about, you know, the humanity of Christ, you know, the gospels, there's four gospels, three are synoptic, which means similar. One is yep. the book of John. So, and all of them have a theme. John's is the deity of Christ. Matthew's is the um, king, king, kingship of Christ. Yep. Luke is Christ, kind of the friend of all sinners. But Mark, who was written through the eyes of Peter, scholars believe, and I do too, right. is this is this gospel that focuses on Jesus' humanity. He's asleep on a cushion in a boat. Jesus gets angry in Mark more than any other gospel because, <laughs> of course, it's Peter's eyes. He's always angry at Peter. So I, uh -huh. I really do portray. I really love, love your portrayal. And I've always, as a man... I, you know, I'm a small town guy like you, right? I hunt and fish and, and I like the outdoors, like 75, I think percent of our listeners do. And when I see Jesus in that, I go, okay, here's a guy I can follow. He's talking smack. He's making fun of, you know, Andrew's uh, inability to dance. He's telling yep. Pete, you know, Peter to shut up, get used to different. I mean, he's yep. just, he's just a guy I would follow. And he just, his, his, you guys have done a couple things I have questions about as a fan. Okay. One of them is his, his relationship with his Ema, his mother, Mary. She's really highlighted in this series more than the Gospels highlight her. That sure. is strategic. Why, why did you highlight her so much? Well, I just think that it is something that is hinted at so often in scripture, but yet, I mean, because at the end of the day, we all know, right, that the scripture, and I, I obviously say this with all due respect, scripture is, is the highlights of, of Jesus's life, right? It's mm -hmm. literally not a literally, you know, a, a play by play. It's the highlights yeah. of that. Um, and obviously, you know, depending on the gospel, you read the highlights of, of Mary and that relationship. But, you know, to pretend that she wasn't there the whole time during that, because she was there at the birth and she was there at his death. Right. And so yep. and the yep. relationship was there, um, you know, and again, you know, like episode, um, I guess, it, what's that, uh, you know, the uh, episode four, no, episode three. Where, Season um, two, episode three, Matthew four twenty four at the end. It, there you go, right? Where where she's. I'm a know, fan. Remember? Right. Yeah. Exactly. You might be able to do it better than me. They all blur together for me. I'm like, all I remember. I know. Is I know. One. I know. It's one big long story, and I can tell you anything about it. But so, anyways, just all of these moments, and and obviously, it, it is something that we have focused on, uh, especially with the women, and that's why the women in this series are such strong characters. Mary Magdalene, yes. Mother Mary. Um, you, you've met, you met Rama and you've met all these other women that are just kind of continuing to grow. And to be honest with you, there's a whole lot more coming um, because it's foolish to think now, sure, cultural things, there were things culturally different between men and women. I um, mean, we address those things and, and, and we yeah, just yeah. kind of go, that's a cultural thing. Like, I, I, I don't yep. know what to tell you other than it was, but it doesn't make, make the respect of women and the importance of women, uh, you know, especially your mom. And you know what? Uh, and this is me, but I'm a mama's boy, like straight up, like, and it is something that Absolutely. I, teach, I, I teach my son. I'm like there, I literally was laying on the bed. We were kind of getting onto my son the other night for some things. And, and he had just kind of said something. And I looked at him and I just said, son, 
there is nobody on this planet I need you to respect more than your mother. Like just straight yep. up. I said, you know, you and I will we'll handle respect a little bit differently, right? <laughs> because he's 16, he's get, you know, he's Absolutely. turned into a young man. I said, but I need you to understand something, right? And and honestly, it's it's an amazing thing to do to watch a son break when he talks to his mother. And, and if you don't, then I question that, right? And I think it's such an amazing thing. I mean, I even told my son, I said, have you ever seen me talk to your grandmother? in any other way than the most respectful thing. Right. And, and, yeah. and, you know, and it just kind of hits him. So I think you can apply that and Dallas feels that way. And the writers feel that way. And there's a lot of things that it's as, as these things get written, because I'm not as involved in the creative side of it. Right. Which is honestly kind of rare for me as a producer. I've been very involved in the majority of the creative, uh-huh. but obviously we have an amazing team, but there's just all these moments um, that do that. And I think another great one was when Jesus goes to Eden, right? Simon's wife that very, very yep. rarely uh, mentioned. And she's another huge female character in this. And he looks Agreed. at her and he says, I see you. And you are, you, yes. saw, you saw in him what nobody else did until me. Right. And he goes, and he goes, that's such an important moment. And I remember when I read that for the first time and I looked at Dallas and Chris was there and, some other producers and other men there with wives. And I'm not kidding. There was more men crying on that set that day, thinking about their wives that are at home. And especially with what we do, right? Because when we shoot, we are gone. Like we, we yeah. are, we, we, we are out of commission and they understand that. And that's a, my wife spoke the other day and she speaks a lot and does a lot of things, but it's something that she speaks on, you know, quite a bit about being that support system, but it's not a support system. Again, kind of like the traditional, you know, uh, uh, I, I hate to even use the word toxic male kind of thing, right? Where women or whatever, but it, it's one of those things where that scene alone, I, I just, I tell my wife all the time, like, I can't do this without you. Can't, uh, and, and that scene alone and Dallas felt that way. And he wrote it thinking about his wife um, and all those things. So um, just to get back to the whole Mary mother thing, I just think that's a lot of it, right? It's just how in the world would you possibly think that she was not involved almost on a daily basis uh, with his ministry, you know? And so, you know, that's, well, and it's huge. It's huge. You alluded to season two, episode three, and the season title, that that episode title is Matthew 424. So it's just an entire episode of on one end, you've got the disciples bickering about (laughs) minutia. And on the other end, you've got Jesus spending an entire day healing people. And at the end, he's walking back pitch dark, limping, bloody, you know, diseases of humanity on him. And mm-hmm. he's so sore and beat up from healing these people and his power going out that he can barely, you know, get his sandals off and his mother comes over and it was just a, mm, you're going to make a real me cry, moving scene. Shut up. It was just no. a moving <laughs> scene. It was a very moving scene between a mother and her son. And then, and then the cool part, season eight, ends with Jesus getting ready to give the Sermon on the Mount. And I thought it was so cool because here comes Eden, Peter's wife, and he goes, hey, he calls her over. There he is with his mother and then with Mary and with Rama. I know you guys, you just pronounced her last name or her name Rama, but in the show that she's called Rama for some reason. Well, it's funny, actually, that even some of the characters have done it. And so there's a kind of a constant uh, uh, debate on that, you know, because it is one of those names that even in real life, and actually we kind of joke about it, and Dallas loves to in, really engage on things like that and almost lean into them to kind of go, well, yeah, the, you know, there may be some people that just say it Rama and some say Rama and, and, and Rama, you know, it's all, it's one of those names. So in, if, if anything, as you meet people in life, I guarantee you somebody with a name like that, their name gets said a hundred different ways. So Dallas has almost kind of embraced it and just go, y'all call her oh, whatever you want. Funny. Right. So, anyway. well, yeah. Cause the American would say Rama, but in Hebrew it would be Rama. Well, I got to right. ask you about her, but before I get to her, it was really funny because they're trying to pick out the color of his cloak. You know, it's going to be red, it's going to be purple, it's going to be blue. And Jesus says something like, you know, mom, I really don't care about this stuff. So why don't you guys pick? And I just yep. thought that is such a typical man. Here's the here's the savior of the world going, I don't care what, you know, I don't care what <laughs> color this thing is. In fact, I yep. wasn't even going to wear it. But you women who understand the details, you know that thousands of people won't be able to see me if I don't have some kind of color. And so right. I just thought that scene was so classic. So, so help me out here. Uh, <clears throat> Rama, where, where did she come from? She seems to be pulled from out of space and a character that you guys created, or does mm-hmm. she become somebody else that, that we read about in the Bible? Where did she come from? 
No, she is. Uh, she's she's fictitious. Yeah, she is not. And 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 a lot of it was just to add a little bit of spark. Uh, you know, obviously with Thomas's character, you kind of see that coming. Oh right? yeah, a little crush. She's got a crush. Everybody knows where that's going and that sort of thing. And honestly, that's kind of what it came out of. Um, but then honestly, as season one progressed, you know, because she doesn't get introduced until the end of season one, um, and and the audience really liked her, and she's got this sass to her, right? And and she's a um, she's very, um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, a Proverbs, uh, uh, a Psalm 91 woman, right. She's very industrious yeah. and smart and all these things coming out of uh, the wine press world. Um, and so, yeah, so she's just another character that, um, has really, it takes on a lot of things that are talked about biblically. Um, and there's some more women, like I said, that are going to pop up even more. So, um, some biblical and some not, yeah. and, and we kind of take pride in that. I don't want to say pride, but we take, you know, kind of one of these things where you're introduced to a character and you've met them for an episode or two. And then all of a sudden it goes, Oh, it's that person. Like, Oh, like it, it, I didn't realize, you know, whether it was, um, you know, the guy in season two, the, the guy that, you know, beat up the, the good Samaritan, right. That's that story. Of yeah. The good yeah. Samaritan. Well, that was. Wow, that was powerful. When that the way the stories are woven together, it just that really impacted me. Well, you know, and the fun part is I I travel around the country and I speak to men and, and about at men's events. And I have a sermon out of Mark 2 called Men on the Roof. And I tell the story of the paralytic being he, you know, you know, lowered. And I'm like, the Bible never says four men carried him. It says he was carried by four men, but there had to be more. And I said, I guarantee you, I guarantee you there's a woman in charge of that thing. <laughs> and when you when I watch that show on the Ethiopian woman, I'm like, are you kidding me? I be, I know I was right. And yeah, so, exactly. And then yep. how, how about how about a uh, Matthew and his crush on Mary Magdalene? That's another yep. little uh, thing that you got going on there. That's so. Uh, but you know it makes sense because you got twelve guys, eleven are single. Yeah. Do I need let, to say anything else let, about that? Let, let, let's not pretend that they're not all eyeball and old Mary, you know, and so and uh, uh, and, and Rama, uh, Rama or whatever. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, uh, yeah. So, again, it's kind of goes back to that humanity of things. Let's not pretend that these people aren't human. Let's not pretend, you know, but you can see even like with Thomas dealing with her. Right. He's trying to do it respectfully. And he's trying to respect the law and he's trying to respect, you know, OK, well, and how, can I and should I and, you know, and all these things. Um, but it's, it's no different than Jesus dealing with his mother. Right. You know, I mean, he yep. even said, he's like, mom, it's not time. Right. With the water to wine and all that, you know, but it, you know, and you kind of saw that moment of Jesus kind of going, am I going to listen to mom here? Or am I going to listen to dad? You know, like, oh, yeah. you know, thinking of his heavenly father going, cause he says it's not time. So you would assume again, you know, you know what assumptions do you would assume that he's kind of going, well, no, God hasn't released me yet. Like he hasn't told me to yeah. begin but it's almost like he used God used his mother, Mary mother to say it's time. Right. And I'm, I'm allowing this to happen. And here it is because then he does ask and goes, okay, use me. It's time. Right. And that whole scene unfolds, but it's almost like, you know, and we've gotten so much flack for this. It's almost like Jesus didn't know that it was time. Right. Like, it, it, you know, and so anyways, uh, we, we love the women and Jesus are in Dallas has done some uh, uh, kind of round tables with the women, the cast and, they're just amazing. And there's some more coming in season three. Um, and, and there will be more that come obviously throughout. Uh, there's oh, going to be a lot of power. Well, I'm, so. I'm, I'm going to try to dig some answers out of you about season three in a second. Come on. I'm, uh, you know, season two ended with a uh, Jesus getting on the platform there, which I thought was a real cool twist on that sermon. But mm. uh, so tell us about, tell us about the character development. You've got Matthew, the, the tax collector who seems to be on the spectrum You've got yep. little James who has a limp that is not yet healed by Jesus. You've got Thomas, who's this um, uh, meticulous kind of uh, sketchy as far as he's emotionally sketchy. He's always kind of on edge, it seems like. You know, you've got, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you've got Peter, who we expect. You've got Andrew, who's kind of a nervous wreck and always emotional. You know, you've got these guys, and it really brings it down to earth. Even, even Judas, you bring Judas on the scene, and you actually – when you first meet him, you're like kind of rooting for him. Like, okay, this mm -hmm. is a good dude. So talk yep. to us about the character development uh, of these guys and, and how you decided on what for which character. Right. Well, obviously, you know, and again, this kind of goes back to a lot of what you've seen in the past of Jesus films, right? First and foremost, the yeah. disciples are, you know, 45 to 65, right? And it's just like, 
There is zero truth in that, right? All these disciples were young men, right? In their 20s, oh, you know, yep, yep, maybe yep. 30, right? At the very most, um, because yep. obviously the scriptures go on and talk about them when they die, you know, 50 years later, 30 years later, whatever it is. And so then they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, right? So so that's obviously a big part of it. But then a lot of it is, is just kind of assigning personality so that when we address certain things, that's being understood. And I think Matthew, obviously Matthew has become a huge, huge favorite and, and, and Paris that plays him is an amazing actor and does a great job, but obviously, right. He's on the spectrum and there is some personal to that. Dallas has a daughter that's on the spectrum. And so there is oh, a really, pers- yeah. And he's touched on this a few times, very, very lightly, but um, and it's just, so it's something that's personal, but then if you also kind of just think about it, right. If you read the book of Matthew, like you mentioned, you know, it's a very high, kind of almost properly in order kind of structured type of book. And then you obviously who he was, right, as a tax collector that was a Jew. And it's kind of like, well, but if you think about the way that many autistic people's brains work, right, it's just very, well, there's this and there's this, and this is better than that. And yes, there's repercussions, but that's okay because this is better, right? And so and so Dallas dealing with those things uh, with the child, he just has this understanding and then applying that to a character was just a personal thing. And it works out and it makes complete sense. Like nobody would kind of go, well, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't add up. That's not how it works. Oh, it was- Pe- people go, that's, that's great. Right. And so, um, you know, and then, like you said, you have all these personalities and like Philip, you know, he's kind of like this surfer, you know, man, I've been living on the land and me and, you know, John the yeah. Baptist and, <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's just amazing. Right. But it's just so perfect for the character and then what he brings to the group as a whole. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things that we as creatives and, and the writers, you know, including Dallas, it's just, how do you make this more interesting? Because what we do, and, and, and the writers say this a lot, Dallas has said it a lot with all of these stories, which we get a lot of flack, but obviously the majority, the vast majority of people just love what we're doing and how we're doing it. it all the made up stuff. It's it, the question is asked very simply, is it plausible? That's what it is. Now, obviously, when our show goes biblical, when it goes scriptural, it's pretty much spot on, right? You can read it and you can like, oh, there it is. It's right there. I remember that piece of the story. It's right there. And we have multiple um, uh, consultants that we work with, biblical scholars, Jewish, Catholic, uh, uh, just uh, evangelical across the board, just straight up historians that look at it. And they just go, okay, well, yeah, it's plausible that Simon and Andrew, as fishermen, this is what they would have gone through. This is what their daily lives would look like. This is the problems, you know, dealing with the Romans. And then you kind of start tying it together. Well, it does talk about the problems they had with the Romans. So we can make up all kinds of problems and say, yeah, that's plausible that they would go through that. And then obviously, once we tie it into scripture, that's kind of the key. And I think that's another thing that has just brought an audience is that it's it's just become very, very personal to people because they see themselves in Mary. They see themselves in Matthew. They see themselves in Simon, right? Which so many people say, well, I'm a lot like, you know, Simon Peter, I have my temper, my this, I'm, you know, always out ahead of the cart and I'm all these things. And then, and, and Shahar just does an amazing job doing this you just kind of watch him and you're like, man, I, I, I say and do those things all the time, <laughs> you know? So, so a lot of it is just personal experiences that the writers put onto the page. And then obviously our actors bring to it and Dallas helps guide it. So. Well, and the funny part about the Peter character is, you know, you always envision Peter as this big muscular fisherman. And here's this little guy with kind of a little man's complex. It's yeah. a totally dip. You know, you got the loud mouth, Peter, you fall in love with the guy, but you're kind of like, he just likes to fight. He's a little guy who's tough. And I'm like, okay, yep. this makes sense. And I love the character development of Nathaniel in the backstory. You know, mm. Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. But, but you know, when you see that he's an he's a architect and he designed a building that collapsed, and you realize in the Bible, Jesus actually mentions this building that collapsed and killed 18 people. You think, okay, well, maybe there's a connection between Nathaniel and this, and it just really ties it all together. Right. And it's just, it's really been fun for me to, to watch, you, you know, you said something earlier, Chad, you said, uh, you guys will say to each other, let's not screw this up. <laughs> you know, how has your involvement with the chosen affected you personally? And then what challenges are you experiencing with the, the amazing success that you guys have experienced? Uh, clearly you're, you're hearing from other groups and getting up, uh, you're getting the attention from, uh, other producers, other directors, other writers, how has, how has your relationship with Jesus changed or been affected? And then what challenges are you seeing that 
could potentially screw this thing up. Right, right. Um, I mean, the challenges are the same, you know, and, and my wife and I talk about this all the time. You know, I've been producing independent scrappy movies for 25 years. I mean, it's just what yeah. I've been doing. I've been doing it full time for, I guess, close to 15 years, 13, 15 years. Um, I, I've been producing films all that time. But, you know, for a long time, I had little side jobs and I had other things that I just couldn't commit, you know, totally. And so when God called us, uh, my wife and I, to be doing this full time. And the weird thing is, is he called me to do it full time and he called her to quit her job that she had at the time. And so she hasn't worked in all that oh. time either. Um, oh, wow. You know, but and so th the good thing is, is that it is something that myself and my wife and my children are used to right this world that we live in this filmmaking world you know and I, I when i speak you know we speak a lot at colleges and various places and i always tell young filmmakers i'm like you better know that you know that you know that god has called you to do this you know because yeah first of all hollywood right i mean come on i don't need to say anything about that brutal um and and, and even for those that love it and embrace it it tears them apart and spits them out over and over oh, and wow. over again and so if you're going to be a believer inside of that system, right, well, okay, now you better also really, really know. So obviously that's been a big part of it. Um, and so the lifestyle, at least for me personally, and obviously I can't speak for others and kind of their, their, their things, that hasn't gotten worse, but it's really more the impact that it's having because, you know, the, the, the joke is, it's kind of like, well, I've been doing this forever. And now all of a sudden the chosen is this kind of big show, right? And it's obviously gotten bigger and bigger and, and the, the popularity and there's fame attached to that. And there's all those kinds of things. So if anything, you know, and I know Dallas, obviously he's at the, the kind of the higher end of these kinds of these issues is really honestly just the humility of it all. Right. Because again, yes. you can kind of, you can kind of start believing your own hype, right. You can start believing these things that honestly the people in Hollywood desire all the time. Right. I mean, and it's, it's a, it's a tricky thing because what we do for a living requires popularity, right? What yeah, Hollywood yeah. does. And then you start tying ministry and faith and the message of Christ and reaching people and doing these kinds of things. And, you know, in the past, I've always kind of heard these things of, well, you know, just God will do whatever he does. And, you know, and, and, and this is we're talking about movies or just entertainment, media, music could apply to this as well. Like, yeah, you know, I just, I don't really, it doesn't matter if people hear it or see it or all these things. And I'm kind of like, well, if God called you to go out and touch people and go out and do these things and impact people with this entertainment piece, and then you turn around and say, well, I don't care if anybody ever hears it. I just want it. I just want it to get out there. I'm like, well, they're kind of hand in hand, right? Because if people are watching, listening, downloading, buying, doing whatever, and they're being impacted, well, the result of that is money and fame, you know, again, uh, and those kinds of things. So it is this weird balance, but I think the key, at least for me, and it's something that I've always said is yes, all those things are great, right? Obviously the money and the, the recognition and obviously the impact is huge, but what is your motivation behind it? Is your motivation yes. to only get money and only get fame or is your motivation to say, well, no, my motivation is this. My motivation is to touch people, to get out, to get the message of Christ, to impact people, to do those kinds of things. Well, and the result of those things are these other things, but then yes. these other things now allow me to do this over here even, even more. Cause if I have money, then I can go and do more and better things. I can touch more lives. I can give more, I can do more. You know, my, you know, I always, you know, my wife always tells me that I have patience and kind of generosity to a fault because when we didn't have money, I'd be like, oh, just, you know, they're fine. They, they needed more than us and I'd be given away. And she's like, no, we got bills to pay next month. Like we can't do that. And now totally. we're in this place where we have that and you can do those things more and you can impact people with the show. Um, and so I think that's kind of been the biggest thing right now as the popularity of the show grows and honestly, just the popularity of those involved grow is that humility. And obviously I can't speak for everybody and not everybody are believers either. I mean, I think that's a big, big well, thing to point out. It's, oh. it's not every, not everybody involved in the show are believers. Um, now I will say myself, Chris, the other producer, Dallas, the creator, Daryl, like um, the, the highest level, right? The, the people that yeah. own the show and that run the show are believers, but there's a lot of people in various positions, you know, not all the cast, all those things. They're just not believers. Um, and that's honestly part of our, I wouldn't call it a goal, um, but at the end of the day, we want the best people for the job, you know, and that's kind of the well, argument. Well, the funny that we part is, there. it sounds like Jesus, this is the weirdest thing I've ever said in my life. It sounds like Jesus is a believer, Jonathan. 
So he's, yes. he's a, so that's good that Jesus believes in Jesus. So, Hey, but I will say this, you know, so you talked about pride, but I'll tell you another thing. And I, I want to talk to my listeners real quick, guys, listen, God wants to put you on display for his glory. And I believe guys that the greatest sin of human of mankind, the greatest sin of men is the sin of anonymity. He wants you to get out of the anonymous bleachers and into the arena and all that that involves. And that's why we call you guys our heroes. And so I think you're right, man. If you're going to produce something and God has called you, he doesn't call us to be anonymous. He calls us to be a light of the world. And so Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you saying that. And I love the fact that you guys realize there's a battle against pride as success. I mean, we see it all throughout scripture and all throughout humanity that pride is actually the beginning of the end. And we just have to stay humble. And that's really good. I really appreciate that. I I get that from uh, the things I watch, you know, the little extras on the chosen. It's just really fun. And so, well, tell us about this. So are you, do you see yourselves ever changing? I mean, there are a lot of firsts with this series. It's a first series on an app. It's the first series that's crowdfunded and there's a lot of firsts here. Do you see as the fame uh, ex- increases that you're moving away from some of these models? Now, at the end of the day, and we, we literally were just in a meeting the other day and Dallas reiterates this all the time. And we all agree this show will always be free period. Like yeah. it, there, there is, there is zero chance um, that we will ever, ever turn from that call of God about this show. And to be honest with you, even that call was not, when we originally started out with this, that was not the goal. The goal, the goal was for it to be on a platform, the angel platform and do all those things. And then just through various events that took us to this thing where, you know, God kind of just laid it on everybody's heart. Like this is going to be free. And then once we started doing that, that's when the show exploded even more so. And obviously, yeah, yeah it's got to be good. And yeah, we got to have marketing. we got to have all these things. But at the end of the day, that's when God really put his hand on it and started blessing it is when we decided to make it free. Now, on that same note, things like Amazon Prime, things like when we put the Christmas special in theaters, all of those things are generating money. But at the end of the day, we always said, like with the the um, the Christmas special, we released it free online well mm-hmm. before Christmas so that nobody could ever say, and not that we want, not that we care what people say, but that that it, it was laid on our hearts to say, look, it still has to be free. And so sure, you may not go to the theater, you may not buy a ticket, and that's fine. And we're not asking you to, but it's just another opportunity, another option for you to go and experience. And obviously we believe as filmmakers, seeing things in the theater is a great experience and you know to share it with others and all those things. The emotion that you experience within a, in a theater is different than you sitting on your couch at home. Yeah. But at the uh-huh. same time, it will always be free. And so it will always be free on the app. It will never deter from that. There may be things that generate money, sure, but it will always, the other option will always be there and it will always be free. So to answer your question, no, we won't ever go away from that model. Um, there may be other options that come up that elevate it or do whatever, but there will always be the option for the show to be free to everybody. Um, you know, and, uh, and I think that's kind of one of the things that's really confused Hollywood by the success of what we're having, <laughs> right? They're just well, like, good. they need, they're, they're like, already they confused. Understand. They need it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're just adding to their. So, Hey, already, so, so, so I, I already know the answer to this question, but uh, how do we, how do, as a guy listening to this show, who's been deeply impacted like myself, how does a guy support uh, this production? How do I give my resources to help you continue to reach millions and millions of people around the world? Yeah. Well, obviously our, our main way of doing that is through the pay it forward. Um, but even before that, I would say that just share it, just talk about it because I cannot tell you it, it is, it's probably in the thousands by now. And this is no exaggeration of people that I've encountered, you know, some being kind of the cinephile snobby. Well, I don't watch Christian stuff because, and I'm the same way. I hate crappy Christian content. Like I just Agreed. hate it. Like, Agreed. I, I despise Agreed. it. I'm like, my, my Bible says to do all things in excellence. My Bible says that in the old Testament, God built the temple the way that he did God knew it was going to be destroyed, but he said, go find the best carpenters, best jeweler, all the things, right? And do my, yeah. do my house honor. And he knew it was going to be destroyed. And so for whatever reason in the film industry, and this happens, I think, in a lot of Christian spaces where it's okay to be crappy, right? It's okay to be subpar, um, you know, uh, anyway. So, um, so I think talking about it and your story is great, right? Everybody's kind of skeptical and ah, Jesus show. And I've heard about the chosen and all this. And then honestly, people go watch it and they're just like, my bad, my bad. (laughs) You know, like I repent, uh, I repent. 
that, that's my bad. But to be honest with you, those are kind of some of our biggest champions as well, right? The ones that said, no, 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 no. I, I hate, I, either A, I don't ever watch TV, or I'm just not a big fan of or whatever, or I hate crappy Christian content, or or whatever your reason is. The ones that, those are the ones that become our biggest voices, that become that biggest champion for it. Um, and so we encourage it. And honestly, we get excited. I get excited all the time when I, I run into people that are overt believers, even, you know, entertainment savvy type believers. And they kind of go, well, man, I'm really sorry, but I, I haven't watched the show yet. I haven't seen it. And I get excited because I'm like, oh, I've met somebody else as big as this is getting as crazy as it's going. I've met someone else that literally is my neighbor that has not seen the show. Um, and yeah. so that just gets us excited. But that's when people talk about it. Right. Um, and then over to the pay it forward. Right. At the end of the day, the show will always be free. And the idea behind it is if you believe in this, if this touched you, if this is something that God has laid on your heart, which we as believers understand. Right. We understand tithes and offerings. We understand giving. Right. No, no, no group of people in the world give more than Christians, period. Like it Absolutely is a factual right. thing. You know, and you can Absolutely talk about government right. and you can talk about liberal agendas. And you can talk about all these things of giving to the poor and the government needs to take care of us. I'm like, you aren't even close to what the Christian faith does worldwide on a daily basis, what we do as believers. But but given that this is another thing for believers to say, you know what? God has laid it on my heart that yep. I want others to see this for free. So you're right. At the end of the day, it's not free, right? We can't do this without money. We don't have a, a, a billionaire in our pocket going, I'm stroking your checks. God told me to give all my money away. And here it is. That is not happening. We don't have a studio doing that. That can obviously monetize it in different ways. This show is funded. Season one alone was funded by 19,000 investors. I mean, that yep. was that, yep. that's when we had investors. And since then, it's been all pay it forwards, obviously merchandise, you know, come and see and the shirts and all the things. Um, and that's just been something that people just love. And we have people that literally like they're just monthly, like I'm given to this, whatever, but I don't care if you've given a hundred bucks or a hundred thousand bucks, you know, we've got some big, big people that believe in this thing. Uh, at the end of the day, that's the only reason we can keep doing this. Um, and, and what, what God's doing, he's using, it's, it's, it's the impossible math, right? Dallas has talked about it and the Bible talks about it all the time, you know, yep. that he will, yep. he will multiply things. And, and that's kind of what's happened with this thing. And, and we're just going to kind of keep riding it at the same time. Next year, people could just kind of go, we're all done now. We're, we, we don't care to see this true, anymore. True. We don't believe that's going to happen. But at the end of the day, that's that's who we're responsible to. We're responsible to obviously God, first and foremost, to do what we're called to do. But our audience is who we're responsible to for. You know, there's again, you can kind of use the examples all the time. There's a ton of crappy shows that are just still out and on TV because somebody in the high tower goes, we're going to keep making this show until it's done. Right. We, we've lost money on it for years, but. Whatever it is, we're going to keep doing it. And this one, at the end of the day, if the audience decides or God decides, um, then we're, uh, we're we're all done. So, but we don't believe it's going to happen. So, no, I agree. You know, it was really interesting. Just again, a huge fan. It, it seemed to me in season two that the writers got a little rushed in the last, not the last episode, but the six and seven. It just didn't have the detail that the others had. And I thought, okay, they're trying to hit a deadline here or something. But, but it always, but I mean, just my, as a guy who's a huge fan, but it, it concluded, you know, ep, in an epic proportion. And I just, like I said, I, I just absolutely love all of them. So there's two seasons, eight episodes each. And if I'm not mistaken, you're going to go out to eight seasons with eight episodes each, or is that, has that changed? It's seven seasons with eight episodes. Oh, each. seven, seven okay. seasons. Now, yep. now, okay. Now I am, you know, you left me hanging. Jesus is on the platform. He's given the Sermon on the Mount, you know, and so I know you're getting pretty close to filming. Are you filming season three yet? No, we, we actually start prep uh, in about a week, a little over a week. We won't start shooting until uh, in April, probably mid to late April is when we'll start shooting. Um, and so, um, you, know, uh, you know, I never make promises, but even Dallas has said this online. We're hoping to start getting episodes out probably by the fall. It's kind of what we're looking at. Well, it's our and when you put them out, you guys are putting them out like you're putting them out every two weeks. I mean, when you guys get ready to put them out, because I'm like checking that app all the time. So uh, you guys get them going. So, OK, so here we go, man. Chad, I, I don't want to throw you under the bus, but can you throw our guys? I mean, I've got we're going to have 40,000 guys listen to this podcast probably the next couple of weeks here. 
Can you throw us a bone? Tell us about season three. Um, well, some things, and we've talked a little bit about it. Um, there is a, 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 a large moment of feeding coming up this season. Um, <laughs> that has to do with some fish and uh, loaves. Uh, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, a large thing of feeding. Um, and I can say that as, as we know in the Bible, when it says that Jesus fed 5,000 people, that that was only the men, right? That's what was, yes. it was, was the men. Um, I, let's just say we will, we won't have 5,000 people there. We will have a considerable I, I, amount of people. Now I don't think we'll have families of five there. Let's not get that carried away, but I, I, it's going to be pretty, pretty epic. It is going to be something I think, that it's going to be pretty crazy. So I think out of your 10, 15,000, I think you need to have two small town hillbillies from Oregon to come out and, and dress up and, and, and cause I can eat the heck out of fish and floats. So, so <laughs> all you gotta do is let me know, man. All you got, or you can look at me. I look like a Roman centurion. Yeah, well, I mean, come on, rolling in, dice man. at the foot of the cross. <laughs> yeah. No, we okay. Can, we, so we might have to do that. That'd be cool. I, that would be really fun. Anyway, I'm anyway, whatever, but Hey, so the, <laughs> I'm just spitballing here. So can you tell me anything? Can you give us any hints about any, uh, character development we're only eight disciples in we got four more to be chosen can you tell us any more about some of these guys that we haven't seen yet uh that mm -hmm. have not been called or or any you know in season two we had a little train wreck with mary you know can, can, is there anything you can tell us any little hints well i mean honestly there's tons in the bible that honestly you can just kind of go to and go okay they're gonna start totally. addressing some of these things right and, and and what i can say at least from a very high level is that and and that the seasons will go uh you know and and, and again dallas has even talked about this online that the seasons will kind of go the next couple of seasons three and four will be mostly jesus's miracles his ministry going out there and doing all these things and obviously what miracles we obviously can't do them all. And there's some that financially will never pull off. And there's some other things yeah. in there, but, and, and honestly, the, the, the focus of that, even when it comes to miracles, Dallas says this all the time, he goes, I don't, I don't care as much about the miracle as it is the impact of the miracle on yeah. that person or, or those that saw it, right. The disciples and stuff like that. So it's not about like in season one, the healing of the leper, right. It's not about the fact that Jesus cleansed this guy and did these things. It's, it's how the disciples responded, how they responded before the leper came to them and all those things. And then obviously once they saw what happened and what that leper went and did. Um, and then obviously we connected it to the, the, the paralytic coming through the roof and the, you know, the, the Egyptian woman and all those kinds of things. And so the seasons to come, you know, will be a big thing. You know, all the disciples have been introduced, whether you know who they are or not, they have been introduced. So everybody will be there in season three. Um, so all, all 12 disciples will be there. Um, you know, there will be more characters and some big biblical stories. And so you, I, I kind of just go, well, go read Sermon of the Mount and just read a little past that. And you at least have an idea, you know? Um, so this is, this is encouraging all you men to go open your Bibles and, and, and totally. read, this, read, read, yeah. read the, read the, read the book of John or read Mark or whatever you want to do. Just go, go read them. Right. So, um, but there are things that emotionally we're going to really try to really attack head on. And to be honest with you, I think there's going to be a bit of controversy coming in this next season. Um, and again, we've rubbed some people wrong, you know, like, like with Jesus, when he was practicing the Sermon on the Mount, like, I can't tell you the amount of people that were so upset. Jesus wouldn't have to practice. Jesus wouldn't have to, he wouldn't have to, he, he is, he, he knew the words before the word, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right. Which, you know, <laughs> freaking people, man. You know, it's kind of like, so, so, so you're telling me that he wouldn't have to practice a speech or, or a sermon, but yet when he was about to go to the cross, which was the whole reason he came to this planet was to go to that cross, that he went into the garden of Gethsemane, sweat blood. He was so torn up about what he was going to go through. And then he even looked, turned to God and said, Hey man, <laughs> there's any way I don't have to do this, right? If this cup can pass from me, let, let's let's have that discussion, right? Let's let's talk about this. It's kind of like you know your son coming to the dad and going, "Hey, I really don't want to do this. Can we can we talk about this? Can we, you know?" Well, and 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 then at the same yeah. time, he had enough respect to go, "But not my will, your will be done." So 
if he can doubt the whole reason he came to this planet and it had to be the manly side of him, right? The fleshly part of him, Absolutely. because again, if he wanted to, he wouldn't have had to gone through the pain and he could have called down angels and he could have done all the things that people talked about, but he knew I have to be a man. And obviously for the 33 years leading up to that moment, he experienced pain, you know, and that's why we showed him like, you know, bandaging things and stuff like that. He knew that his mother was going to be standing there watching him go through this. Right. Yep. He also knew that I'm about to be separated from the father too. Right. I've got to go into paradise. I've got to go do all these things. I've never, you know, going from heaven to earth sucked, but now I got to go heaven down there. <laughs> right. I've got to yeah, take totally. one more step. You know, so all of these things, and yet he's not allowed to rehearse a sermon. Like he, like, well, like, you know, here's so. the other thing. <laughs> Here's the other thing in Matthew 17, uh, Jesus is uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration and the father, he had just told his disciples, he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to die. His yep. disciples are blowing him up, right? So he's got to be doubting. He's got to be, I don't know if the word doubting is, is right, but he's got to be just going, man, this is, a, I'm alone here. Mount mm -hmm. of Transfiguration, father says three things. This is my son who I love in him. I am well pleased. I think that that happened because Jesus, the man needed it. And so 100%. it's so good, man. So, okay. I got a question about a character. Okay. Come on. A and I don't want you to ruin it for me, but I kind of want you to do, <laughs> I kind of do tell me about Atticus, the secret. I think his name was Atticus. He's kind of a Roman secret yep. service. Like he's a Roman Navy seal. Yep. Talk to me about that character. Does he become somebody that we might've heard about in the Bible or is he fictitious? Well, the, the interesting thing is, is even the writers will tell you, um, and there are certain things they won't even tell me um, because they haven't made that decision yet, you know, and so obviously yeah, they want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, it, but I can say that, you know, the, the Roman people that you have met, and there are three, right? There's kind of three main yeah. Roman people Gaius, that you've met, right? Uh, yeah. The, 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 who's the, who's the big Pontifex? Quint, Quintus, uh, Quintus, 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 yep. yeah. Quintus, and now Quintus, Atticus, Gaius, right? and Atticus. Yes. So all of them are important people. Um, what we have not decided yet is, are they significant people that you've read about, but they do cover the things you have read about. So I'll just tell well, you, that. I'm looking so, at, I'm looking at Gaius. I'm looking at mm -hmm. Gaius going, Jesus is going to heal his son. He's going to heal one of these guys as kids. <laughs> I just know it. I just know it. Anyway, uh, hey man, yeah. hey Chad, I, you, you know, clearly I'm a, clearly I'm a fan and, uh, which makes it for a very difficult interview because I'm like, you know, I'm a fan. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. Hey, uh, I would just say, guys, uh, man, you got to go check this out. Go mm -hmm. just watch season one, episode one. And if you are not all in, I will give you your money back. So come on, uh, come guys, on. guys, listen to me. What I want you to do is go, go just watch season one, episode one. That is your boots on the ground assignment. You will be blown away. And man, if you haven't seen the shepherd, you need to watch that, that little 20 minute video, and you need to put it in the back of your hopper for next Christmas that you're going to show your family. So Chad, man, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I, lo I love hearing uh, your wisdom and what God is doing to use you in this experience. And uh, man, thank you for being a man in the arena yourself. I appreciate it, man. And, uh, and uh, kudos to you for what you guys are doing. Um, everything from the spiritual to the mental, to the physical, I love your push-up challenge. Uh, we had one called the filthy 500 that we did for, uh, during quarantine. And it was every day for 90 days. I did this 500 push-ups, 500 squats, 500 crunches and run two miles. And I did that every day for, for 90 days during, you know, quarantine. Cause I was bored. Um, so when yeah. I saw your push-up challenge, man, I admire that too, because again, you know, if, if, uh, if you're, if you're lazy and out of shape or dead too early or whatever the case may be, well, then how are you going to be any, any help to, to, to the, to the ministry and to what God's called you to do? Um, so I commend you guys, man. And, uh, really, really, really appreciate being on the show. This was a fun one. Well, man. Man, really I cool. really, I, I appreciate that. I've already hit, uh, you know, I think I hit 350 yesterday. I'm at 75 right now and got my timer going. You know, my deal is I got to get the separation between the deltoids and the biceps, because when I'm Come rolling on. dice at the foot of the cross, when I'm on the chosen, I'm going to need to look good. <laughs> That's right. You better, you better be better bring your jacks because we ain't playing. Oh, baby. I'm going to, I'm going to be man. yoked, baby. Yo, anyway, <laughs> Hey, no problem. Thanks so much for coming on, man. So guys, make sure you head on over to men in .org, Grab a free copy of my book. Tell them what great fathers tell their sons and daughters and 
Sign up to join one of our many virtual teams that are impacting men around the planet. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And be a man. You've been listening to the Men in the Arena podcast. If you hunger to be your best version, then join thousands of men from around the world in our Men in the Arena forum on Facebook. This is the best place to have open discussions around the topic of biblical manhood. Make sure to explore our website at meninthearena.org, sign up for the weekly equipping blast, and take advantage of our many free resources designed to help you become your best version of a man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. Remember, when a man gets it, Everyone wins.